Oh. All right, family. I put out a uh, I put out a a little poll in the uh, in the group yesterday. If there was anything that anybody wanted to discuss, anything that anybody wanted to unpack, and it was the easiest poll ever because it was only one vote. <laughs> So we're going to come from Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. It's going to be our focal point. It's, where, it's going to be our runway. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he hath loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in Christ in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. This is our runway, family, all right? God who's rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. To really understand that God loves us, right from the jump, before we go anywhere else, to understand that it is he who loves us. It helps us to to take a certain posture when we approach him, all right? If I know that God loves me, when I go to God, I'm not going and thinking, well, maybe uh, maybe he's going to get me today. Maybe he don't think the best about me today because maybe I functioned out of, out of, uh, out of his reality when I was driving the car yesterday, Lord. And I, I don't know if I want to, Right, I don't know if I can approach God today because I let that person on my job get under my skin, and I responded out of the flesh, and I said some things that I, I wouldn't want to say around my brothers and sisters in Christ. So I don't know if I even want to approach God today because, right, we start to adopt an Old Testament mindset that says, "If you do this, I'll love you. If you do this, I will love you." If you do this, then I'll do that. And so we look, but it's Bible, right? Stuff in Exodus, Deuteronomy, uh, uh, Leviticus, but it's Bible. If you do this, it's Bible, but it ain't for you, right? Right? Because you're not a servant, you're a son, although you're a son that serves. You're not a servant, you're a son. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he have, He loved us. So understand we're loved. I, I, I miss the mark. I'm loved. I'm on point. I'm loved. Everybody say to yourself out loud, don't unmute yourself. Say, I am loved. With a great love. I am love. I hope you're able to say it. I hope you're able to say, I am loved. I'm not my mistake. I'm not my sh uh, 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 a shortcoming. I am loved with a great love. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. We were dead, but he's quickened us. He's given us life. He's made us alive with Christ. By grace, we're saved and have raised us up. <clears throat> have raised us up, given us life and raised us up and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, here's the confusion, right? <laughs> we think that when we're seated, uh -oh, no, most people aren't going to get this, but I'll, I'll explain it. We think that when we're seated, that we're we're like Steven Seagal, right? Steven Seagal is the only person that I've seen <laughs> sit in a chair and still fight while being seated. I haven't seen it anywhere else than a Steven Seagal movie. He'll sit in a chair, he's seated, but he's still there fighting, flipping people over, breaking up, all this other stuff, right? That's not how we're seated, family. He didn't raise us up to sit together in heavenly places to, to fight. Raise us up to war in heavenly places. He did not do that. He did not do that. 
We have been made to sit together in heavenly places. Being seated is a position of rest, family. Is it not? If, if you've been standing all day, you've been walking all day, do you not welcome a nice, soft, cushiony chair? Being seated is a position of rest. And where are you seated? In heavenly places, sure. Heavenly places, sure. In, in Christ. Not just with Christ, because you can be seated with Christ and 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 be across the room. Yeah, we yeah we all in the we all in the room together. That's nice. That's cool. But he said no, in heavenly places in Christ. What does that mean? What are we talking about? Does that concept not emphasize our union with Him? That we are connected spiritually. And our spirit being that our spirit is the life of our body, that that spirit can give life to our body. Spiritually connected to him, we share in his victory, his righteousness, and his authority. I, you know, family, I made it a point today to not, sometimes, you know, sometimes you get, you, you start praying, you're dealing with something, you get a little excited, you get a little aggressive and all of this stuff. I, th I think I passed, right? But I tried to make it a point today not to even get too excited, just to speak out of a calmness, speak as from a position of being inside of Christ. Family, where is Christ seated right now? Don't say it out loud. I mean, don't, don't, don't say it on the chat. Say it somewhere in your room, where you're at. Where is Christ seated right now? Couple people, couple. Where is Christ seated right now? Christ is on the right hand of the Father. This is what Scripture teaches us. He's on the right hand of the Father. Where are you seated right now? Some of you saying in Christ. Some of you saying on the right hand of the Father. Absolutely. There's a level of intimacy being in there seated, <laughs> being seated on the right hand of the Father in heavenly places, right? He's not far off. We're in his presence. We're enveloped in his presence. We're in Christ. We're enveloped in his presence. We're right there seated next to the Father. We're enveloped in his presence. This intimacy allows us to experience his love his fellowship, his guidance. It's a recognition of these things. Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When something's presented to us, Lord, I can come to you. I know I can come. Look, family, the thing is, when we, when we live in a lifestyle of sin, I don't know one person who has lived in a lifestyle of sin, having known better, that was confident to go before the Father because they're too caution, conscious and aware of a fallen lifestyle that they were living out of rebellion. And if I do know them, they haven't shared it. But we approach, let us approach God's throne of grace. What is grace? The supernatural endowment to live a righteous life. Grace isn't all. You can keep on sinning. It's okay. It's okay, little baby. I love you. And yeah, God loves you. But then let us approach God's throne of grace. Grace is the supernatural endowment to live a righteous life. What is a righteous life? It's the life that Christ led. One that's not in bondage, one that's not bound with sin, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Ephesians 2.18, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. 
All right. So if I know if I know where I'm seated in Christ, if I know where I'm seated in Christ, I recognize my union with Christ. That's my authority, my victory, my righteousness. Two, it brings me to a place where I'm recognizing that I have the intimacy with God that is necessary for life. Three, it's a freedom from condemnation. It's a freedom from con condemnation. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. If I know that I am in Christ Jesus, then that flesh that pulls, the flesh is going to pull. The flesh is at enmity with God, but that thing can be brought to heal. Who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let's not cut Romans 8, 1 in half. We hear Romans 8, 1 all the time, and it's there for there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and we leave it. But I, I, I'm told in Christ, I'm in Christ, so there ain't no condemnation for me. Let's not get caught up in deception. For when you walk after the spirit and not after the flesh, that means there is a condemnation when I'm choosing death over life. And it's a condemnation that I myself am bringing on myself because I'm choosing death. I can't choose death. I can't choose rebellion and expect to live God's best. I can't do it. I cannot do it. God's not a liar. God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he shall also reap. If I sow the activity that produced life, fellowship with God, right relationship, walking in the righteousness of Christ, I reap life. But if I sow rebellion, if I sow uh, wickedness, confusion, and all of these things, well, those are the things that promote death. I reap death. But we don't have to. Colossians 1.22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. We're all, this is all talking about being seated seated in Christ. When we recognize and know where we're seated, we, we, we come into certain modalities of operation. The certain modality of operation. I've sent the, <laughs> I've sent the video, and sure it had some language in there, but I've sent the video to a few people. Uh, it, was, it was from a movie, Saving Private Ryan. I sent the video. And they, the people were griping to the captain. He's like, oh, what would you say, Captain, if you was in? He's like, look, I'd say it's a great order, sir. God, you know, uh, fine mission, sir, da 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 Right? Why? He was in a certain position to have to function from in order to lead the people. Oh, well, thank God I'm not a pastor. Amen, cool. But guess what? When you go to the job, when you go to the workplace, and you got people looking at you. Matter of fact, forget the job. When you go to the grocery store, you got people looking at, oh, ain't nobody paying me no, no attention. Bible says you're made a spectacle for both men and angels. So whether you see physical people looking at you, the spirit realm is always watching. The spirit realm is watching you when you're in your room by yourself and having those conversations out loud. The, the, the spirit realm is watching you when that person turns around and you flip them the bird because nobody can see you. The spirit realm sees you. We are made spectacles for both men and angels. When we keep that in mind, we're able to function from a certain modality, a certain mindset. These kids, we would cuss. Don't be cussing, Greeny. <laughs> when we were kids, we would cuss, right? 
um, we would cuss, but we knew not to cuss in front of our parents. That's a no-no. At least, at least in my house, it was a no-no. You don't have to cuss in front of your parents. Crazy. There's a certain modality that if 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 mama's right there or if pop's looking or listening, we gonna we gonna stand up right. Certain words we just they ain't even gonna say. We ain't even gonna say words that a kid shouldn't say that might be a little bit more adult. We ain't even gonna say that. Even as a child, when you recognize there's a certain standard that you had to walk by, you could practice self-control. It's when we get to be adults and then we're like, man, I keep doing this, I keep doing, I keep my I have self-control. And I had it in an earthly fashion when I was a child. How much more being that I'm a child of God, I have self-control. I don't have to have inappropriate conversations with people. We're talking about a kingdom mindset. Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the things necessary for life. Seek first the kingdom. In his righteousness, whose righteousness? The righteousness of Christ. Not the righteousness of me loading myself down with all this work and thinking that this work is the thing that makes me righteous. No, Christ, your sacrifice makes me righteous. And because of the righteousness that you have now bestowed upon me, I walk out a life of righteousness. Colossians 3.2, set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things, on things above. Well, what's the thing above? What, the earth realm. Well, the thing above is us being seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Can we see it? Each and every one of us that has been born again is seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and wickedness in high places. Those high places are only if you're looking at it from an earthly level. Only if you're looking at it from a carnal level. That's the only way that these things are above. Principalities, powers, rulers, dominions, and high play wickedness in high places. But I, if I'm seated in Christ... And I recognize my seat, my position in Christ, then what's higher than him? This is how we take these two scriptures and we, we reconcile them together. What's higher than him? Nothing. Nothing. So am I seated in him? Or do I see myself from an earthly plane of existence to where I got to try to bypass the demonic, the principalities, the spirits, the celestial, whatever you call it, to get around and hopefully I can get to God. Am I waiting for an angel to break through in war in the heavens to get me a message from God? Or do I recognize where I'm seated? Do I recognize that I'm an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus? An heir. Jesus is an, the heir of the Father, right? That's what the Bible says. We're joint heirs with Christ, right? That's what the Bible says. So are we saying that what belongs to Jesus belongs to me? That's what the Bible says. He's given us all things that pertains to life and godliness according to the knowledge of him. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And I'm about to bring it to a close. Because with being seated in heavenly places, the thing is, I'm not seated there by myself. I'm seated there with you. You're seated there with me. So there's a unity. There's a unity. Remember the, the scripture, we talked about it on Thursday. If you saw the Christ in your live stream. We talked about a little bit on Thursday, John 17. He said, Father, let them be one in me as I am one in you and them one in us. 
There's a unity with other believers. Or maybe it's not. If it's not, we got to go back and check to see if we truly believe what it is that the word of God has said about us. Do we believe it? Or is it a suggestion that we are, in fact, one in him? This is, again, this is the Lord's Prayer. John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. We're not talking about the Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy king. We're not talking about that. Most of the times people call that the Lord's Prayer. But the Lord's Prayer is actually in John 17. Father, let them be one in me as I am one in you and them one in us. Now glorify them with the glory that you have, that I have had before the foundations of the earth. Glorify them with that same glory. Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. How can I affect peace with my brother and sister? I'm one with you. I don't need to be at odds with you. I'm one with you. I don't need to hold a fence towards you. If I hold a fence towards you, it's going to be hard for me to express the love of God towards you because I'm too busy being hurt. I'm too busy trying to protect myself. I get it. Nobody wants to be hurt. I get that. Nobody wants to be hurt. It don't feel good. But family, when you chose Christ, that's <laughs> what you signed up for. You signed up for putting yourself out there and for somebody to spit on you and for you to love that person. You put yourself out there to represent Christ to the earth. Jesus knew he was going to be betrayed, yet he still loved Judas. Jesus knew that he was going to be betrayed, break bread with him and everything. He gave the thief the bag, calling you forward, calling you up. Yet and still, Judas was a thief. Scripture says he was a thief. He didn't want the woman to waste the ointment because we could have sold the ointment and I could have took something off the top. Love doesn't hold a record of wrongdoings. But if I'm not recognizing the unity I have with Steve or or Isaac, or Sister Taylor, or Sister Sonia, if I'm not recognizing the unity, we're all in the same body, sure, maybe, maybe I'm an elbow. Maybe Sister Taylor's a shoulder. But are we not still part of the same body? If my shoulder is injured, are my body parts not going to work in tandem to do something about taking care of my shoulder? Or are we going to be like, nah, I ain't going to go over there and deal with that shoulder. The body's not going to be able to function the way the body's supposed to. So being seated in Christ means unity with other believers. Something that I've had to kind of work on myself and not because somebody offended me just because certain for me certain teachings that certain teachings that make you a that doesn't produce uh, a level of freedom in your life I'm really opposed to that I'm opposed to that and I found myself having to Uh, reconcile the person from the doctrine and not treat the person as if they are the doctrine. And this is why you start. You may have heard me talk about from months ago. Maybe, I don't know, maybe even longer. Well, look, look the body of Christ is like grade school. You got pre-K all the way to 12th grade, and then you got college, right? So somebody who may be a cessationist 
which is somebody who I believe in Jesus and I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior, but the gifts ain't for today. Healing ain't real for today. Speaking in tongues and baptism of the Holy Ghost, that ain't for today. So none of that's for today, but I believe in Jesus. He died for me, da 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 Well, you're pre-K. And that's okay. Why? Because I think most people, at least when I was coming up, most people went through pre-K, then kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, and on, on up, right? So if it's like, well, it's pre-K, you know what? They believe in Jesus. They're not believing in a lot of things, so they won't experience his best for their life, but they believe that's a start. That's pre-K. God bless them. God bless them because, and I found ways to love and to, to honor somebody in a position that's, uh, again, I don't really respect the, the doctrine, but it's like, oh, but they're somewhere. So finding a way not to be offended, but to find a way to like, you know what? We all started in pre-K. In, in, in the natural, we all started in pre-K in the natural. So if these brothers and sisters can choose Christ and they don't think that there's no power to work for them today, but they choose them anyway, man, that's amazing. In pre-K, you might be a pre-K teacher, but it's amazing. Then you come on up and then somebody starts to get uh, bound by the law. You know what I mean? And we, we say that is legalism. Oh man, that's, that's legalistic. And I used to be legalist. That's legalistic. Maybe legalist legalism. Maybe that's uh maybe that is uh kindergarten, or maybe it's first grade. Legalism. Legalism is when you try to hold yourself to the laws. If you do this, then I'll do that. If you don't do this, then I won't do that. Oh, you're under a curse. Or when you do this, now you come under a blessing because you've done this. Right? That's legalism. Oh, God's going to take his spirit away from you. I didn't go that far. God's going to take his spirit away from you if you messed up this, that, or the other. It's legalism. It's like, nah, that don't, that don't help benefit you at all. But then I had to step back and be like, you know what? That's a brother. They love Jesus. That's a sister. They love Jesus. They don't see this thing. How can, I, how, how can you, as a natural man, expect a kindergartner to understand what an eighth grader understands? That would make you the crazy one. I'm going to hold this preschooler up to a 12th grade mindset. Don't work. All right? <laughs> the last scripture I'm going to share is 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. And we're going to open up the floor for any questions, comments, concerns, disagreements, something I need to unpack more, uh, anything along those lines. And I think since the song your hand went up maybe 10 minutes ago, 10 minutes ago. Come on, Sister Sonia, what you got? Unmute yourself. We thank you, Father. Circling it down to a three. It's going to keep going down. Thank you, Father. If it's not already gone by now. Well, yes, yeah, Sister Sonia, unmute your mic, sis. Thank you, Jesus. All right, well, well, um, Again, I know you're on the phone, so I can't really kind of guide you through where the unmute button might be. Uh, so while you're working on that, Sister Sonia, we'll go ahead and jump to Steve. Is it, oh, can here she is. Can you hear me? I hear you now. Okay. Um, I had walked out the room just for a second. Um, and when I came back, you said so much since then. <laughs> so um, I'm going to... I I think this is what you were talking about. Um, not um worrying about earthly things, not um <clears throat> trying to satisfy your flesh, um trying to satisfy your spirit. Is that what you were on at one point? 
I'm certain that I was at some point, but uh, there any questions from that? We were talking about bringing the flesh under subjection. But was there a question that stemmed from that? Or because this report yeah. and I'll post. No, I just kind of wanted to make a, a statement that, like, um, it, it was so much, but that I, I don't really worry about um, earthly things anymore because I had just. I've I've had so many earthly things and, and then I've had nothing and I haven't been any happier with earthly things or with nothing. Um I've been more happy and more fulfilled with having nothing because when I have nothing the only thing that I do have to lean on is Christ. So and then when I have everything physical of this world, it doesn't give you the time and the space that you really need to give to Christ. And it's just so much more fulfilling. And it was a lot more I had to say, but <laughs> um, that's all for now. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, sis. All right, Steve or Luna, or maybe it's Brady. I don't know. Oh, that's me. Steve. Oh. Hi, what's up? How's that mic? Is the mic good? Yeah, mic's great. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on, on well, actually, I don't know, it might be a comment or it might be a question. I don't know how this is going to come across, but uh, when you say Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, I've actually, and this isn't my belief, this is just what I've heard. Um, contradicting scripture, but Jesus isn't at the right hand of the Father, but he's um, omnipresent on the earth, if that makes sense. I've heard that said before, but I can't remember where, but I've heard that taught before. That he's omnipresent on the earth? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've, I've just heard that people speak that, that he's not, he's not at the right hand of the Father at the moment, but he's omnipresent on the earth. And I would read through my scriptures and I'd be like, no, that's not what scripture says. That's not what scripture teaches us. You know what I mean? And then when you try to you try to present that to people, it's it's sometimes it can I don't know, it can it can cause like the headbutting, you know, the disagreements, you know, yeah. the division, you know, people just will will latch on to things that are said. Um even if you're presented with the truth, you know what I mean? So, yeah, it's just I've heard a, a contradictory teaching to that. But I can't, I can't remember where I heard it from. Okay. Um, was it from somebody who wasn't recognizing that they were in Christ? Probably, probably yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. Jesus said, I will go and I will send you a comforter. And I will have my habitation inside of you, right? So in a sense, Jesus is omnipresent in the entirety of the earth, wherever the sons of God roam, because we're his body. So Jesus is right now in Baltimore City, just as he's in Columbia, just as he's in Texas. Wherever the body of Christ is, Jesus is there, whether we function from it or not. Right. So part of that is true. Right. However, Romans chapter eight, verse 34 says he I'm sorry. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? And I got to read 33 because it sounds like Christ is condemning. Um, <clears throat> let's go to 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession forth. So it's right here saying that Jesus is at the right hand of God. You know what I mean? So to say that he's not at the right hand of God would be to call this, call it a lie. But yet and still, is he uh, is he present in the earth? Yes, 
He said, I will go and I will send you a comforter. I will send another unto you. I will send you a comforter. But matter of fact, I will make my habitation inside of you. So where I go, Christ goes. Where you go, Christ goes. This is how this is how big God is, family. Can we accept it? Because I have to, Jesus said, look, <laughs> I'm with you, but I'm not with you now. I'm, when, he, when he was saying a prayer in John 17, he said, look, I, I'm not with you anymore. Paul talks about us being multidimensional, if you will. We're here on earth, yet we're in heaven at the same time. What are we talking about? To the natural mind, it doesn't really make that much sense. But this is the mind of the spirit. You're here in the physical, but you're also seated in the heavenlies, in Christ. You're in him, and matter of fact, he's in you. So we have this dimensionality thing going on here. Would that make sense, Steve? Yeah, man. And as you were talking, I think I remember her where I heard it, but I'm not going to repeat who I heard it from. But I, I remember. I recall now. I recall. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, Captain Jack Sparrow. What's happening? <laughs> A whole lot, sir. A whole lot. You over here trying to short circuit some wires. <laughs> so can can you unpack just how we kind of function from that duality there? We're on earth, but we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. He's seated next to the Father. So essentially, shouldn't that mean that we should not have that uh challenge when it comes to prayer or asking what his will is for anything okay oh, challenges are good challenges are good because through challenge through through uh not even, i only want to say conflict through challenge through a proving ground you're able to recognize that yo i can do this i i, I have grown um so let's say a child, when he was younger, he couldn't take off a top to a soda. But as he gets bigger, as his muscles begin to develop, then it's like, ah, that same thing that you couldn't take off a couple of years later, take the cap off. But I can't do it. Boy, take the cap off the soda. All right, he's trying, he's trying. Grip it. All right, grip it tight. It might hurt your hand a little bit. Grip it. It ain't going to kill you. Trust me. And then he begins to, and then he sees that he can do it. But a challenge was presented to him that had he not faced that challenge, he would never know what was inside of him. He could read it all day. I was a kid. I couldn't open a soda bottle. But now that I've become a bit more mature, I read, I can open a soda bottle. Okay, nice. My only experience with the soda bottle is I can't twist that cap off. But now that the challenge is presented to him, it's in his face, it's present, he can touch it. It hurts a little bit. I can do this. Challenge is good. We have the mind of Christ. We have to let that mind be. We've got to allow the mind of Christ to function through us. We know that the, the Old Testament talks about the life is in the blood, right? But that we have a source that's even greater than the blood. It's the spirit of God, which is life. You think about how bad Jesus was whipped and scourged. And then, not just that, whipped, scourged, beat. Then he had to carry a cross a good ways up a hill, right? You know, when you're if using physical, uh, you're using muscle and energy, your blood starts pumping even more. Should he not have bled out by the time he got to the top of the hill? How many, has anybody ever thought of that? Should he not have bled out by the time he got to the top of the hill? Exerting energy, huffing it. 
You can carry something that's not as heavy as a cross. You'll feel your heart beating fast. That heart beating is getting the blood flowing and pumping. So whether they hit some, you, do you think that maybe they hit some arteries? Think maybe there was some squirting going? Sorry if this is graphic, but this is something that we think about. We would think in a natural to suffer that type of abuse, we'd never make it. But Jesus said, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I am going to accomplish. And the life-giving spirit that was in him allowed him to accomplish that thing that would not have been natural for the flesh to accomplish. Does that make a sense? Did I answer your question, Captain? I know I kind of went. No, oh, snap. Did we lose Cap? No, sir. I'm here. Um, you did answer it, and I, I had to think for a moment on uh, letting that mind of Christ function through us part. I was like, snap, yeah, that's that's where the learning the truth and the word of God to allow your mind to see from his perspective, to, to speak from his perspective versus what we grew up with, essentially. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your input, brother. <clears throat> Questions? Come on, Sister Sonia. Got to unmute yourself, sis. Sister Sonia, you there? Sister Sonia, did you walk out again? Hello. Um, can you read John sixteen seven? John sixteen seven. Yes, please. Thank you. John sixteen seven. <laughs> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. All right. Sis? Yeah, that's all. Um, when when um, I don't know who it was, was talking about... Um, Jesus being at the right hand and then also um, being with, um, which I'm not saying he's not with us, in us. I'm not saying that at all. But I was just kind of going off of that and saying how he left us with the Holy Spirit also. Okay. I mean, if I'm, if I'm, if, Correct me if I'm on the wrong track. No, he, he did leave us. He, he did send the Holy Spirit, right? Um, and I don't. I think it may be in Matthew where he's saying, and I will come and make my habitation. Like there's wording that he used that, that specifically showed that there was a oneness. Right? Oh, I know. I know. Yes, yes. I, I, I totally agree with that. Okay. Amen. Okay, thank you. That's it. All right, sis. Thank you. Come on, Cap. One other thing I was uh, kind of curious about when praying for people's healings. You know, some people get frustrated when they don't see the results. Huh? Um, how, how do we encourage someone that feels like they're trying but it's just not getting through. You know what I mean? Because for me, I know to just keep on pressing. I know despite my experience, Jesus is a healer. You know, I, I 
I'll never give up on that one. That's one of those things where it's like too late. <laughs> you could try and lie all you want, but I know Jesus to be a healer because he has used my hands to heal someone. But when people continuously try to step out and they don't see someone healed, um, how do you encourage them or walk them through that uh, that discouragement? You're talking about, so if I was going to lay hands on somebody and then I didn't see them healed, or are we talking about I lay hands on somebody and, well, I guess it's kind of the same, and that person is discouraged because they didn't see the healing. What are we talking right. about? The second I laid one. hands on them. I didn't see them get healed. The first one. You know, I, I've been praying for these many people and nobody's getting healed is what it appears to be okay um <laughs> the way you answer is going to depend on your relationship with the person all right but i'm just going to give you this the, i'm gonna try to <laughs> i'm gonna try to give you the softest sweetest answer possible as if maybe you and that person aren't of a good rapport stay encouraged Trust what God says above what you see. All right? We walk by faith, not by sight. Jesus uh, healed the lepers, but it's only when they walked away that their healing was recognized. Jesus could have been like, man, they walked away, and they walked away 10 lepers. Oh, well, God, why ain't it working? Oh, gee, oh, Father, help me. He didn't do that. They walked away. Go show yourself to the priest. They walked away as lepers in his natural sight. But as they were going, they said, oh, snap, hold up. Then one turned back. Yo, wasn't there 10 of y'all? What of a nine? <laughs> I ain't got no right for them. But I'm here now. I don't know about them. I'm here. I'm healed. What? So it's a thing of standing in faith. It's a proving ground. Are you going to believe what the word of God says? Or are you going to believe what your experience says? All right. And so uh, I, I think that was pretty, pretty gentle, you know, sometimes. Thanks, Kat. Um, Shelby, what about you, S Sister Shelby? You got some questions? Come on, Sister Shelby. I want to hear from you. Sister Good Taylor should have never let me know you were there. <laughs> no, she's actually changing Storm's diaper right now. Okay. She just went in there, so. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. All right, anybody else then before we uh before we call it? All right. 